Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Sinato with Real Progressives. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I know most people are watching the State of the Union address or you know different live streams around that. Uh, you know, here with us this evening is uh, a candidate running for New York State Assembly, uh, Adam Balmol, uh, whose district is out in Staten Island, I believe. Adam, thanks for joining us this evening. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, no problem. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about uh, your background, your district, and what inspired you to, to run for the seat? Absolutely. So my background, I guess I'll start with that. Uh, I'm originally from South Florida. Uh, I joined the military back in 2009 and served until 2013, uh, and I served in the U.S. Navy. Uh, shortly after detaching from the military, I was home for a few more months, just kind of getting all my uh, stuff in order. And then I moved up to New York City uh, in August of 2013 to start school, which I did so at John Jay College. And I majored in political science. Um, but it's, it's important to bring up that while I was actually um, going to school there, I interned at the New York State Assembly. This took place about three years ago. Uh, the reason I bring this up, actually, is because I went through something that very few interns in the history of the state of New York could ever say they went through. I was there in the midst of two of the biggest indictments in New York state politics history, and they occurred in the same session. Now, the first one took place of the former speaker, Sheldon Silver, and the second one took place with the Senate majority leader, Dean Skelos. Now, the reason I bring both of those up is because a primary focus of my campaign and one of the main reasons I'm actually running is to increase both transparency and accountability in our government. This is not meant to be some partisan um, pissing match or anything like that. I don't think either party, especially in the state of New York, has a monopoly on on morality or on making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing in government. So that I would say is very important to mention for why I'm running in this race. And, uh, you know, New York is, you know, rated uh, all the time as one of the most corrupt uh, state governments. Um, I, I know you mentioned uh, Sheldon Silver and Skelos. Uh, I believe Silver had his conviction actually overturned. Uh, but ethics reforms from those, those issues and not only you have uh, Governor Cuomo's aides who are currently on trial for corruption as well. Uh, so there's really been no meaningful ethics reforms uh, in the, the state government. So could you, uh, you know, explain a little bit about what you would like uh, to push uh, if you were elected uh, as far as ethics reforms are concerned? Uh, and how would you like to push the, the Democratic Party in New York to uh, for those of you watching, the IDC uh, is an independent Democratic conference. They're Democrats, but they caucus with the Senate Republicans. Now, Adam, you'll be in the Assembly, so you won't have to deal with them directly, but they are uh, a major impediment to getting you know, progressive uh, reforms and uh, for the Democratic Party actually uh, you know, accomplishing uh, much. So uh, can, can you talk about those issues within the state government? Absolutely. Uh, actually, ethics reform is is one of the main points of why I'm running. Um, just it's not the same house of government, obviously, but um, there's a state senator who is actually part of the district I currently live in right now. Uh, as you would imagine, the assembly districts don't completely align with the Senate districts because they're much larger. But uh, the state senator that is the district in which I in the state Senate district I live in, his name is Marty Golden. Um, he has been involved with a lot of controversy as of late. Um, just to give you perspective, he, I want to say about a month or two ago, was in a situation with cyclist where the cyclist states that he pulled over and was blocking the cycle lane and actually pretended to be or impersonated himself as a police officer. Now, this is not the only issue. He was involved a few years back in a situation where he, the vehicle registered to him struck a woman and a few months later she actually passed away and this is what all this time has passed he's still been in office so i mean there's other things as well for instance one of the cars that i believe he owns or has a lease in 
that is paid for with taxpayer dollars. And it's not the cheapest car you could have. I believe it's a Chevy Suburban. The lease monthly that New York City tax or New York State rather taxpayers are footing the bill. That's just unsatisfactory. And that's just an example of one of many reforms that I would think would be very necessary in, in addressing in the New York State government. And, uh, you know, Ross Barkin is uh, another progressive candidate. He's running against Golden. Um, you know, have you been uh, involved in his campaign at all? Um, I'm not sure how much that Senate district overlaps with your assembly district, but um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what groups you've been working with or other candidates you've been working with within New York? So uh, actually, in regard to Ross, he um, he's actually being opposed. There's two Democrats running in the primary. So it's Ross Barkin and Andrew Gennardis, who opposed Marty Golden four years ago. I haven't taken any sides. I'm, I'm still getting to know both candidates, their platforms. At this time, I would say I have have a lot to look forward to with both of them. I've seen a lot of promise. I think they both have a lot of great ideas. So I think it would be premature for me to, I guess, lean one way or another. But I've definitely started talks with both of them and, and definitely would love to be more involved moving forward, especially once the primary takes place. Uh, as far, I think, what was the other part of the question you asked? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about um, not only just the, the candidates you've, you've may have worked with, be working with, but some of the, the organizations and the activist groups that uh, your campaign is either reaching out to or, or working with uh, down in the city? Of course. Okay. So that's, that's a very good question. I'm happy you asked. Uh, so one of them, the one that's lo most local to me is Bay Ridge Democrats. And then there's a whole slew of Democratic clubs that are in Staten Island. Because the district I'm running in is actually a small slither of Bay Ridge, which is in Brooklyn, New York, for anyone outside of the state, and Staten Island, which is essentially a little bit of the North Shore and the East Shore of Staten Island that runs a little bit past the Great Kills Park. So my district is majority Staten Island, but it also does incorporate Bay Ridge. Now, another part of reform I think is necessary is in gerrymandering. Now, people tend to think gerrymandering doesn't happen in places that are typically controlled mostly by Democrats. That is not the case. It is absolutely happening here as well. Uh, anyone who has not seen district maps in New York, I, I strongly advise them to do so. Because if you look at just at mine, which again is district number 64, you'd see that the Staten Island section is actually rather well drawn. It's, it's a pretty straight line map, and it seems pretty fair, at least from what I've checked out and what I've seen demographic wise. Now, the way it's connected to Brooklyn and more specifically Bay Ridge is where it gets a little dicey. So we are connected by the Verrazano Bridge, which, again, for those who do not live in New York, is the most expensive intrastate bridge toll in the United States. So I'll have constituents, if, if I win this race, who are separated by the most expensive toll in the United States and by a highway a, a few miles of the Belt Parkway. So I don't know how you get less contiguous than being separated by both a highway and the most expensive toll bridge in the United States that's in the same state. So there's definite reforms needed there as well. And, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, Staten Island is, uh, you know, generally viewed as the conservative part of New York City. Has that been, uh, you know, your experience and what are, you know, some of your strategies to, you know, reaching out to uh, voters in your district that other may, uh, you know, trend Republican or, you know, voters, you know, I think the Democratic Party uh, across the country is really trying to figure out a way to connect with those voters who uh, have been disenfranchised and don't come out and vote. So can you, you can tell us a little bit about what your experiences are uh, talking with people within your district? Well, I can tell you this, Staten Island, even though um, it's actually most voters are registered Democrat, but e despite the fact they don't necessarily come out and vote that way, um, but it's extremely high union representation. It's, it's a very large uh, blue collar work environment. So these people are, are working very hard day to day and they're dealing with situations like ridiculous time to travel to work. Uh, so 
these are all issues in which I intend to address through economic reforms, which I think is far more likely to reach voters and have a, a profound effect than trying to use partisan divide issues and saying Trump this, Trump that, Hillary this, Hillary that, or, or what may have you. So I think using economic points when I'm talking to voters is the only way to persuade these voters that perhaps voting as a Republican, you could still vote for a Democrat because you see that they, they're looking to increase the amount of money in your wallet. They're looking to decrease the amount of time it takes you to get to work. I'm looking to make sure that public schools are, are doing their job and, tr and teaching your kids what they need to know to be successful in the future when they are looking to be working in the workforce or whether it's a white collar, blue collar job. So I would say economics is absolutely front and center in my campaign. And can you get uh, more into uh, some of the issues that you're, you're running in, uh, on, in your campaign? I know you uh, went over a few of them uh, you know, just now and you mentioned ethics reforms, but uh, you know, are there any others? And um, can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit about you know, some, uh, you know, a couple issues that uh, you know, you're, you're really uh, looking forward to you know, champion and push and uh, make some progress uh, within the state assembly? Absolutely. Uh, so the first and foremost, I, I need to put this one up front and center, the New York Health Act. Uh, the New York Health Act is, if it, if it is passed, would be the first state passed single payer act in a, in a state. So it'd be only in New York City or New York State rather. Uh, so the reason I think this is so incredibly important is for one, we could be the democratic state we, we champ or claim to be and pass this and we could show the rest of the country just how well it can work if it's given the opportunity to do so. Uh, everything I've read as far as research from nursing unions, from doctors, from even certain smaller healthcare providers have said that this would greatly reduce the cost of receiving care. It would also completely get rid of co-pays and other expenses that can actually lead to people becoming homeless or other ramifications that that have a, a, just a horrible effect on people because let, i mean there are so many different health conditions that can just come out of the blue out of nowhere and uh it's not something that i i want people having to roll the dice on uh so that's one now the second issue when some people hear it it may t take them aback a second but when you actually look at the way it's been addressed in other states i think it'll quickly become obvious that we need to take a much harder look on passing this. And what I'm referring to right now is actually adult use recreational marijuana. So as a veteran of the US Navy, I have many friends who are going through PTSD, different, uh, different situations. They're not all the same. So, but what I've done research wise, I've seen that one of the most prevalent ways to treat PTSD is th with cannabis. Now, there's a whole other medical range of things that are addressed as well, but again, back to economical, you can't, you can't ignore how much money is being raised for, for, by uh, tax revenue. Like just for instance, in Colorado, they've raised hundreds of millions of dollars that are going towards scholarships, going towards funding schools, and essentially can fund anything you need to use that tax revenue towards. So I think when you are putting that in front of Staten Islanders, even if they're not crazy about the idea of someone smoking cannabis or, or consuming it in any variety of ways, I think they'll be more inclined to hear about what you have to say when they see all the positive ways it can affect the economy of New York State. And, you know, I, I know, um, you know, I, I hate to mention Ross Barkin again, but I know uh, this past week he mentioned, and I've seen it, you know, because I'm from Albany, so I've seen, uh, you know, different people uh, and politicians argue about uh, the divide between New York City and, and the rest of New York and the issues between, um, you know, appropriating taxes and funding for different things and um, so, you know, what are some of the issues that you've seen uh, and, and would you like to change anything in terms of, you know, uh, how New York City and the rest of New York, um, you know, kind of balance uh, in, in terms of state funding and uh, state resources and, and, you know, everything like that? 
So I've done a bit of research on this. I would say I could definitely get more, um, but it's mainly in regard to the MTA. Uh, the MTA, I would say, is probably an organization that could pr could be run better if it's run by the city. Um, I think anything outside the city should be run by the state. But the MTA being run by the city, I feel like you'd be cutting out that middleman and getting these I issues addressed more, more quickly. Uh, for instance, only about a quarter of our subways in New York City are ADA compliant. Now, that may blow people's minds who are not from here, who haven't maybe been here. But, I mean, if you're going in Manhattan, many of the subways there – will have, whether it's an elevator or other means of someone in a wheelchair or other people who have difficulty uh, with mobility getting around. But when you get to outer boroughs like Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and especially Staten Island, it, it's almost impossible to use public transportation or in a wheelchair. I don't think that's a value that we should be sticking to as New Yorkers. We, we should be proud and trying to lead the way making sure every subway is ADA compliant. And that's something I, I would say is near and dear to my heart as far as why I'm running in, in, for this seat. And you know, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has uh, received and warranted a, a lot of criticism from progressives, um, you, know, you know, from enabling the IDC to uh, more recently delaying calling for uh, special Senate elections that uh, allows Republicans to keep the majority until uh, the this year's budget is passed. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you would really uh, like to, to pressure uh, for the Cuomo administration to change? I'd like, well, for one, I believe I read a report recently uh, through FBC filings that he has about $30 million just sitting in his uh, in his war chest. I would love to see him donate, or not donate rather, but dedicate some of those funds to some of these state Senate races that really need to be addressed. Uh, for instance, they, uh, when I brought up earlier the New York Health Act, it fell only one vote short in its committee. So I know there's some kind of unity plan with the IDC members. If the IDC members do dedicate them, excuse me, dedicate themselves to rejoining the Democratic Party and retaking power as far as forming those committees, we can easily pass a lot of these reforms that are very necessary. Now, there's there's been some things where the mainline Senate Democrats have fallen short on as well, so I don't want to just let them off the hook. But I would say the, uh, the IDC rejoining the Democratic Party and them coming together to be as progressive as possible can be done if Cuomo leads the way as as the governor that we elected him to be. And, you know, you noted that you, you know, basically just finished college uh, and Cuomo made a big deal last year out of unveiling this uh, free college tuition plan. Uh, but, uh, you know, progressives and uh, a lot of critics noted there are a, a lot of strings uh, attached. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if John Jay is uh, part of the, the state school system, but I, I mean, what would you like to see? Uh, you know, what would, uh, you know, a free college tuition and, uh, you know, a, a better, more improved uh, New York State uh, university system, what would that look like? And what would you like, um, you know, New York to lead the way on when it comes to uh, providing more opportunities for, uh, you know, students to be able to you know go to college without having to worry about going into debt. Absolutely, I'm I'm happy you asked that question. Actually, so I would be in favor of making well, for, well, for one, you you brought up John Jay, the school I went to. Let me actually get to that first, I guess. Uh, so John Jay is part of CUNY. So New York is kind of bizarre for again for any people watching who do not live in the state of New York. We have the State uh, University of New York, which is SUNY and then City University of New York, which is CUNY. So they're both college systems. Uh, John Jay is part of the city one. But um, I'd, referring to college being capable or accessible, rather, for students, I'm not a fan of the way it was passed where there are uh, restrictions based on f family income. I don't feel that that's actually in the best interest of the state because, for one, families that are more wealthy are not children to state or city institutions. They're going to Columbia, 
They're going to other schools that are private schools. So I don't feel like they're looking necessarily to take advantage of programs like that. Now, another thing as well, I think for certain programs that might cost more money, I think uh, there should be some incentives applied. For instance, uh, I know there are certain things as well with the program that's currently enrolled, I believe where you might have to stay in the state for 10 years working. Otherwise, you'd have to pay back any of the incentives that you've received to go to school. Now, I think that's a good step. But as you said before, there is a lot of red tape. There have been articles written about all the issues that students run into as far as not taking enough credit hours. Um, many students have actually had issues, whether it was with illness or having to leave, take care of family, and they've lost their benefits. So I feel like this is a major thing that needs to be addressed, and it should be far more simple and far easier to understand for the regular student and the regular family than what it currently is at this very time. All right, and uh, Adam, you know, uh, before we go, is there anything else you would like people to know about your campaign uh, or your, the, you know, some of the issues facing your district? Absolutely. So I'm not running a campaign looking to smear my opponent. I, I know that's so common nowadays with, you know, this and that, and, and that's not what I'm looking to do. I, I'm like, I'm looking to show clear and, and very distinct differentiations between my opponent and myself. For one, my opponent has never held a town hall, and she's been in office for over seven years. I think that is just not in the best interest of constituents. Uh, now, I'm going to be actually looking to address that. I'm going to be rolling out a whole slew of legislative uh, ideas that I will look to try to pass through the assembly if I'm elected. So that will be one of those issues that I look to address. But um, I guess back to... To speaking in summary, um, I probably should uh, uh, tell the uh, viewers about my uh, my website. Um, it is uh, baumelfor64.com. So it's uh, B-A-U-M-E-L-F-O-R and then the number 64.com. Now, all my uh, platform positions are outlined on there, and I'm going to be adding more shortly as well to address with both adult recreational marijuana, to address with women's issues, because uh, another issue as well is the fact that currently in the state of New York, we passed um, reproductive rights legislation two years before Roe v. Wade was passed. Now, the reason I bring this up is it does not actually protect women for their health in the event that they have a complication with their pregnancy. Now, it's only protecting them as if their life is is in danger. It's not protecting their health. So there are certain situations that could arise, whether it's cancer and other rare situations. So this needs to be codified in New York State. So that's something as well that I'd be looking to sign on to immediately if I'm elected to the New York State Assembly. All right. Well, Adam, uh, I want to thank you again for joining us this evening. Uh, for those of you watching, I posted his campaign website uh, into the comments section. So if you want to you know, check out... Uh, more about his campaign and follow him on social media or send him some donations, uh, you know, check him out on that website. Uh, Adam, it's it very nice meeting you. Uh, you know, good luck, and I hope to have you on, uh, you know, somewhere in the near future. Um, you know, and, you know, uh, and again, I know I asked this before, but, uh, you know, feel free to uh, plug anything else in if you'd like before we, uh, we head out. No, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess one other thing is, so I, I'm a major advocate of election reform and election donor reform. Uh, this is why I've, for the last year and a half or so, I've actually been uh, part of a Wolfpack Nation. For those uh, who know what it is, it's essentially trying to get uh, donor reform to the con into the Constitution through the state level. Now, many people are familiar with Citizens United. Repealing Citizens United, I don't really see as a viable opportunity, especially with the court being 5-4 in favor of conservatives. So another one, I think another viable avenue to doing this is actually doing it through the state level and then passing it through enough states that it would be addressed as a constitutional amendment. So again, I would have people checking out Wolfpack um, as far as that and different measures that they're looking to do as far as getting that addressed. All right. Well, Adam, uh, again, you know, thank you very much uh, for, for joining us this evening. And, you know, for those of you watching again, uh, click on that website uh, to learn more about 
uh, Adams campaign. Uh, you know, even if you're not in New York, uh, you know, it's a you know major battleground for politics. Uh, you know, across the country, uh, you know, and it's a big deal, and we need to make New York a progressive state uh, in order to you know bring out that political revolution uh you know we're all working toward uh across the country so adam uh you know thank you very much uh and good night everyone thanks for joining thanks